a stoic response to pain and this is what we're gonna go through today just because um to kind of open up like at this point of time in my life i'm going through quite a lot of pain on a daily basis mental pain you know and 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 yeah um it is actually a way for me to like uh, learn something new so that I can help myself. But I think that on my way to, to learning new things and on my way to, to getting better and just understanding things and thinking through things, I can definitely just also give you something, which is kind of uh, the reason why I'm having the podcast, because I want to do something that, that helps other people. And I hope that by doing that, which I'm doing right now, that, that I'm also doing so, and I don't know. I would like to be able to be in a position where I can help others by doing what I do. But I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to be in this position. I don't know if this is what I'm going to do. But yeah, anyway. Um, let's see. You know, a stoic response to pain from the sto- dailystoic.com site. The link is going to be down in the description as always and also in the show notes. So if you want to check it out on your own, please check it out. And maybe also check out some other articles by the Daily Stoic website which are all about stoicism, as the website name even says, or the URL, but yeah. Whenever you suffer pain, keep in mind that it is nothing to be ashamed of and that it can degrade your guiding intelligence, nor keep it from acting rationally or for the common good. And in most cases, you should be helped by the saying of Epicurus, the pain is never unbearable or unending, so you can remember these limits and not add to them in your imagination. Remember, too, that many common annoyances are a pain in disguise, such as sleeplessness or sleepiness, fever and loss of appetite. When they start to get you down, tell yourself you are given in the pain or you're given in to pain by Marcus Aurelius. In 1931, on a trip to New York City, Winston Churchill was struck crossing the street by a car going more than 30 miles an hour. A witness at the scene was sure that he had been killed. He would spend some eight days in hospital with cracked ribs and a severe head wound. Churchill somehow retained consciousness when he spoke to the police. He went to great lengths to insist that he was completely to blame and wanted no harm to come to the driver. Later, the driver came to visit Churchill at the hospital. When Churchill heard that the driver was out of uh, work, he tried to offer him, the man who had nearly killed him, some money. More than his own pain, he was worried that the populace but the publicity from the accident would hurt the man's job prospects and sought to help how he could. Nature is merciful, he later wrote in a newspaper article about the experience, and does not try her children, man or beast, beyond their compass. It is, one, it is only where the cruelty of man intervenes that hellish torments appear. For the rest, life dangerously, take things as they come, dread not, all will be well. In the years to come, Churchill and the world would witness some of the most hellish torments that man would invent. Yet he, along with many of our ancestors, endured the pain as well. As horrible as it was, eventually all would be well again. Because like Epicurus said, nothing is unending, you just need to be strong and and gracious enough to get through it. And yes, of course, nobody likes to feel pain. You know, why would they? It hurts. Yet Bill Bradley, the basketball basketball player and former U.S. senator is right. There has never been a great athlete who did not know what pain is. That can be expanded. There has never been a great person like Churchill, an example above, who did not experience pain and did not learn from it. So the next time you feel pain, whether it is a broken arm or about a depression or the string of a rude remark, think about, a, uh, think about what a stoic would say. They would say, I don't like this, I wish it hadn't happened, but I'm at... L- I'm at least learning what pain is, I'm exploring my tolerance for it, and I'm growing because of it. The last thing you want to add to the equation is bitterness and blame, or rage. Anger always outlasts hurt, is how Seneca puts it. It also distracts us from the opportunity. It also also deprives us of the education we could have gotten in that moment. And in closing, remember another line from Seneca. Misfortune is virtuous opportunity, the military puts it more simply. Embrace the suck, every stumble, every painful moment, every struggle, every missed chance, every, every fool up, it is all, it's all a moment in which you can practice calm, strength, fortitude, resilience. It is all a moment to practice virtue, to be good, to be kind, to be patient, to be understanding, to be the person you say you would like to be. It won't be easy, in fact, it will probably suck, but it will make you better. So fuck pain, there is pain in life. There is pain in life, but I still want to be a good person. I still want to be this person that I think I should be. 
I still want to be this person that I think we all should be. Well, not not necessarily, but I do want to be this person that I think is good to be, which is a kind person, you know, which I would also say is a successful person. I want to be successful in my life. This is something that I want to have, that I want to do. What I just, you don't want to have that, I don't care, but I want to have that in my fucking life. And I want to be remembered as a good person and I want to help as many people as I possibly can. Because I know what it is like to feel the pain. I know what it is like to just feel bad about things. And this is not something I want to have for anybody else. You know, I know that we learn through these things. So in the end, I, 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 I appreciate the pain. But on the other hand, it is like, well, I don't necessarily want you to, to go through the same shit as I went through. Um, and, and of course, it might be something, you know, if I tell you what it is just really, really about and whatnot, like all the nuances and stuff, uh, then you might think, well, um, that's not that bad. And I have to, to say like, yeah, it might not be that bad for you. But but something that we all have to understand is that we all deal with pain in a different way. And we all think that different things are differently on the painful level meter, you know. Um, some people think that this is bad and this is the worst and some people think this is bad and this is the worst. So in the end, it really is a subjective thing. And in the end, it is like, I don't know. It's like, you know, we're going to feel pain and, and yeah, but I want to see if there's something else. Stoicism and pain management, uh, in praise of chronic pain. Nope. Let's go through this one as well. Stoicism and pain management. Let's see what it is all about. Let's see what we can learn. Let's see what we can do here. Is it long? Ah, well, let's just go through it. Um, Pain management, four techniques practiced by Marcus Aurelius. This is a guest post by Donald Robertson. Donald is a cognitive behavioral therapist, trainer, and writer. Robertson has been tirelessly researching stoicism and applying it to his whole... uh, in his work for 20 years. He's also the author of the remarkable new book on Marcus Aurelius, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. The Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius knew about using stoicism to cope with chronic pain and illness. He had personal experience of doing so. In the years before he was acclaimed emperor, he was already mentioning various health problems to his Latin rhetoric tutor and good friend Marcus Cornelius Fronto. As to my present state of health, you will be able to judge that easily enough from my shaky handwriting. It is true that as regards my strength that is beginning to come back and nothing remains besides of the pain in my chest, but the Alka is working on my wind wipe. Wind pipe, I'm sorry. The Roman historian Cassius Dio confirms that Marcus had problems with his chest. He adds that he has also had a stomach condition had a stomach condition and took Uh, but very little food and that always at night. He says that Marcus used the traditional compound known as theoreic, which contained a small amount of opium to help him endure the discomfort caused by these problems. Marcus' condition probably deteriorated when he had to leave Rome for the first time following the outbreak of the First Marcomanic War. To assume command of the legions in Upper Pannonia, or modern-day Austria, the cold climate apparently. Uh, what the cold climate apparently his symptoms worse. Okay, Cassius Dio reports a speech in which Marcus says to his allegiance in Pannonia, "For it is on behalf of the state that I continue to toil and to undergo dangers, and that I have spent so much time here outside of Le- outside of Italy, though already an old man and weak, unable to take the." To take either food without pain or sleep without anxiety. This difficulty sleeping appears to have troubled him for years, perhaps as a result of his other health problems. Uh, he mentions more symptoms in the meditations where he thanks the gods that remedies have been granted to me through dreams, especially against blood spitting and dizziness. It's possible to diagnose Marcus' health problems occur- accurately in retrospect. He probably developed several different conditions at various stages in his life. However, some modern scholars have speculated that he suffered from chronic stomach ulcers, among other things. The history, uh, the Historia Augusta, suggests that Marcus became physically frail after devoting so much of his time to studying, his main interest being the law, rhetoric, and philosophy. This claim is also found in Cassius Dio, although he had something quite remarkable about Marcus' physical fra- fra- what? frailty. 
To be sure, he couldn't display many feats of physical power prowess, yet he had developed his body from a very weak one to one capable of the greatest endurance. He doesn't mean that Marcus was physically strong, he means that though physically frail and prone to illness, he was nevertheless surprisingly resilient. He outlived many of his contemporaries, almost reaching the age of 60, despite being surrounded by plague and uh, stationing himself at the front during the uh, Marcomanic Wars. I believe that, in part, Marcus became more physically and mentally resilient through his training in Stoicism. Which could definitely be the case, like, I don't know, I don't, we, we, we could... You know, we could definitely just discuss that, but but yeah, could definitely be the case. I mean, mental things really do uh, also uh, just let you feel better physically and stuff, you know, and also vice versa. How Marcus Aurelius Cope with Pain There's a chapter dedicated to Stoicism and pain management in my book, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, the Stoic Philosophy of Marcus Aurelius. It doesn't give us a neat summary of the practices he employed we have to analyze the text and reconstruct his approach from various scattered remarks. However, coping with pain is a topic that he returns to quite frequently. Rather than dissect what he says in the meditations, I'll just give you some of the key strategies described in plain English. Some of these resemble techniques used in modern cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT for pain management. I'll interspense a few comments about how to practice them based on my own experience as a cognitive therapist. The first one is separate your value judgments from the sensations. It is not things that upset us. It is not things that upset us, but our judgments about them. This is what the Earl of Shaftesbury, an early monastic, called the sovereign precept of Stoicism. Marx would tell himself that pain is just a rough sensation in the body, nothing more or less. It can make us better uh, or a worse person, but how we respond to it can. It can't make us an... I see. It's an absolutely fundamental principle of stoic ethics that painful or pleasant sensations are neither good nor bad, but rather indifferent. At least with regards to the supreme goal of our lives, it is natural for us to prefer not to experience painful sensations or other symptoms of illness. However, once they are already happening to us, we should accept the fact rather than becoming upset or frustrated. Stoics therefore suspend their value judgments about... The well judgments about the external events, including pain and, and other bodily sensations. If we can avoid imposing strong value judgments on unpleasant sensations, we thereby eliminate a whole layer of emotional suffering from our experience, allowing us to cope better with the rough sensations we feel. I tend to refer to this technique as cognitive distancing because it resembles a strategy of that name found in modern cognitive therapy. There are lots of different cognitive th- therapy techniques that can help you to do this most monophilos of stoicism though simply repeat a phrase like it's not the cessation that's upsetting me but my attitude toward it you know i i gotta have to be honest you know i think about getting a tattoo which uh which is gonna say a lot of stoic things meaning that i'm gonna write it actually down on just i don't know my arm or my wrist on wherever maybe even on my feet uh, or my, you know, just just very small, like deliberately, um, maybe on my fingers. Like I don't know, fingers would actually be cool, but fingers are always a little bit of a uh, of a dangerous thing, you know. The second thing is consider the consequences of good versus bad coping. We do something like this in modern therapy to help build motivation for change, which research shows is actually one of the most important re- ingredients ingredients determining success. Uh, the, Stoics ver- the Stoics very frequently refer to a similar technique. In typically uh, laconic fashion, they often prefer just to remind themselves of the paradox that our anger or sorrow often does us harm or more harm than the wings or things we are upset about. The majority of people take it for granted that pain is harmful because it hurts. However, the Stoics argue that pain doesn't necessarily do us any harm or real harm because it doesn't affect our moral character unless we allow it to do so. This is very interesting. Which means that if you feel a little pain but you're still a good person, then everything is alright. That's fucking amazing. 
The real harm comes from allowing ourselves to wallow in pain or become frustrated with it because these emotions injure us at a much deeper level. A more thorough way of exploring this perspective is to imagine yourself standing before a fork in the road leading into your future. One of the left, uh, on the left is the path of passion or rather pathos, emotional suffering, that entails wallowing in your pain or feeling angry or frustrated about it, viewing it as awful or catastrophic. Imagine where that road leads if you continue down it months and years from now. On the other hand, to the right is your future down the road of reason and stoic virtue. The road of wisdom, self-discipline and endurance. Imagine how that leads in a different direction and how the paths or two paths diverge further and further apart as the months turn into years. Having a vivid sense of that contrast between the good and bad along term consequences can help us to find the motivation required for change which often requires some effort and persistence to achieve. Always. I know. We always have to be persistent and put into effort into things, whatever it is, whatever it is, a podcast, whether it is something else. But yeah, actually very long article still. Um, I'm still going to go through it. But yeah, I'm very sorry that my voice is maybe a little bit fucked and um, sounding not that nice, but I really try to. And I also am a bit dizzy, to be honest. You got to drink something afterwards. But I, I know I'm, I'm very well in time, which is something that I appreciate. So yeah, how awful is the pain? Is it really the end of the world? When we are upset, we tend to make events seem more harmful or threatening. Cognitive therapists describe this as catastroph catastrophizing. The Stoics question how unbearable pain is by asking themselves whether they are capable of enduring worse. Perhaps you have experienced worse in the past. Perhaps other people have endured worse and knowing that can sometimes help you view the discomfort as something else severe or less severe. The discomfort is uh, relatively speaking. Another way of doing this is what I call the appreciation by analysis. Uh, you could perhaps also say the catastrophizing by analysis that entails dividing the experience up as much as possible into smaller and smaller parts, which you can deal with separately in a, in a piecemeal fashion. I also like to describe this as using a divide and conquer strategy to overcome our suffering. Remaining centered in the present moment is perhaps the simplest way of isolating the experience. Focusing on the uh, transcendence of sensation can also help e.g. by reminding yourself that the pain will be gone eventually or that it comes and goes over time. Often pain feels less overwhelming if we just focus on coping with uh, the here and now and forget about what lies beyond that. Taking it on step, uh, one step at a time, Marcus several times refers to a famous Epicurean saying that pain is either severe but short-lived or acute or chronic and less severe. People cope uh, people cope, that is, by focusing on the knowledge either than uh, that the painful sensation are temporary or that they could be much worse. Either way, as Marcus tells himself, it's never truly unbearable. No, it is not, because you wouldn't have been able to bear it uh, up to this point. The fourth one is, what ability do you have to cope with? Or what? One of the earliest cognitive ther theories of stress developed by Richard Lazarus is known as the trans what? Uh, transactional or seesaw model. It says the psychological distress is often due to an imbalance or disparity between two factors, our perceived ability to cope and the perceived severity of or severity of the threat we face. If you believe that a threat is minor, it is not a big deal, and your ability to cope is strong, I can handle anything, then you won't be very stressed. At the other end of the scale, if you believe that a threat is extremely serious, this is a catastrophe, and that you're totally incapable of coping, I just can't handle it, then you're probably going to freak out. We've already seen how the Stoics challenge and reappraise the perceived severity or awful of a threat, such as uh, physical pain or illness. They also address the other side of the, quick, of the equation, Though, by asking themselves two types of questions about coping. How could someone you admire cope with the same problem? And what resources or virtues has nature given you that could help you cope? Two amazing questions. Fuck me. Fuck me and fuck yeah. Some people cope well with pain and illness. Other people cope very badly with the same set of challenges. Marcus saw many examples on both sides and he chose to spend time carefully and systematically meditating on the example provided by those who coped well. He studied their characters and was a, 
uh, and ways of thinking and sought to emulate what he learned from them. Uh, we can see him doing that in book. Uh, what in what see him doing that in book one of the Meditations, for example, where he notes how his Stoic teacher Apollonius of Chalcedon consistently maintained his commitment to reason and virtue without complaining, despite enduring severe pain and long illness. If we take time to reflect on the strength and character others have shown when enduring health problems, we can often gain inspiration and learn from their attitude. Doing so may, doing so may also increase our own self-confidence or perceived coping ability, which leads to reduction in stress and emotional suffering. Looking at ways we have managed to cope with similar problems in the past and potential skills or resources that we could apply now can have a similar positive effect on our self-confidence. In short, the more we think constructively about ways we could cope better, the more confident and less upset we tend to feel, and even when experiencing major challenges such as chronic pain or illness. Motherfucker, yeah. Stoic acceptance, which is going to be the last point, and then I'm going to end the episode because my voice is only very sore. Perhaps all of these strategies converge on the basic stoic attitude of accepting painful or unpleasant sensations and viewing them with studied indifference. This is a major theme in modern evidence-based approaches to psychological therapy, including pain management. Indeed, we often refer to various modern forms of cognitive behavioral therapy as the mindfulness and acceptance-based approaches. When people become frustrated with unpleasant feelings and try to control, avoid, or suppress them, research suggests that often it backfires by making their suffering worse. One obvious reason for that is that when we perceive something as very bad or threatening, such as chronic pain or illness, we naturally tend to dwell on it to the exclusion of other things, as though putting it under a, mag a magnifying glass. Oh, uh, That just tends to make the whole experience worse. That's What's the alternative, though? Well, it seems we are capable of learning to actively accept unpleasant feelings, even physical pain and other symptoms of illness. The Stoics and their predecessors, the Cynics, appear to have already grasped the paradox of acceptance thousands of years ago. Accepting pain rather than struggling against it often makes it more bearable. The Cynics used to say that sensations of pain are like wild dogs chasing us. If we panic and try to run from them, they'll give... Uh, what they'll give chase even more f uh, fervently, snapping at our heels. However, sometimes a wise and courageous individual who does the opposite and turns to the face them calmly may cause the hounds of pain or hounds of pain to cover and back uh, away with their tails between their legs. When we face pain regularly over time and actively accept it, it often becomes less threatening. We become fear. We overcome fear when we face everything and recover. Dio Chrysostom, a sophist who studied under the great Stoic teacher Musonius Rufus, said it's like a boxer who fares better if he's prepared to be struck a few times and to accept the blows with relative indifference. If, on the other hand, he keeps shrinking nervously away from his opponent, he may expose himself to a worse beating. He also compared enduring pain to trampling out fire. If we do it gingerly, we're more likely to be burned than if we stamp on it confidently. Children even make a game of quenching flames on their tongues by doing it quickly and confidently, he says. Today we speak of grasping the nittle um, to make the point that facing something and accepting it often leads to less injury than approaching it hesitantly and defensively. If you brush against a nettle, you'll get stung. If you hold the nettle tight in the right hand or in the right way, pressing the sharp spines flat, you'll prevent it stinging you. By calmly grasping the nettle of pain rather than struggling against it, resenting it or complaining about it, we can learn to suffer from it less. How He who learns how to suffer well suffers less. And yeah, with that being said, I'm going to end the episode there. So I wish you the best health and happiness and all success. And also hope that you're going to rise up when you're going to be remembered. Being a nice person is a good thing. Three other questions that I have you are why are you here? What are you trying to change and what is bothering you the most? These three questions. I hope we are going to show you your purpose, maybe even a business, which is a pretty fucking cool thing. And um, I hope we are going to show you your purpose, maybe even a business, which is a pretty fucking cool thing. And um, and yeah, I am hopefully going to see you the next time. Please figure out if you could say something to somebody that is indeed going to change their life, because I totally believe we all can say something. But yeah, I'm going to see you the next time. Bye bye.